first thing you need to connect the assets first and get the data. So that's, we call it like static digital twin. And then you can use it for simulation. Then you move to the second version, which having like a shadow digital twin, which you have an image of what's happening, but you can monitor. But the truly digital twin is monitor and control. Welcome to Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Cam, a podcast for industry professionals who are transforming the industry using digital. I'm Jeffrey, and in this show, we look at various digital innovations that help lower costs, improve productivity, and reduce emissions. If you want to discuss this show further or just stay in touch, you can contact me on Twitter at Jeffrey Can or at JeffreyCan.com. In this episode, I'm in conversation with Amar Sabah, who is the Vice President, Industry and Partnership for Private Networks for the Oil and Gas Industry Vertical at Ericsson. Ericsson is, of course, a well-known international telecommunications company. 5G network technology marks a huge advancement over 4G, and it is the power of 5G which is unlocking all kinds of creative digital innovations around the world. Oil and gas is, of course, cautious to do things like replace its entire telecommunications infrastructure. But private 5G networks are much more of a wireless add-on than a replacement for SCADA. And with private 5G, oil and gas can do things like embrace robotics, connected worker solutions, dynamic digital twins, and many other solutions. Here's Amar. Amar, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. And uh, so you and I have known each other for a little while, but it's always useful to get uh, a little, little clarification on your uh, your personal background and uh, where you've come from. I, uh, today's conversation will be around uh, your latest work, which is in private 5G networks, a critical technology for the digital revolution. But I know you got into this uh, in in uh, through your career, um, as many of us do, in not not always a straight linear path. Maybe, maybe you could share a little bit about your, your personal journey and how you got into this. Sure, sure. Uh, so I got uh, my engineering degree and I did my MBA in Portland, Oregon. Then oh. I worked in US and I worked in the Gulf region for over like 15 years. Hmm. Uh, during that, I got involved with oil and gas industry in US, in uh, Middle East and Africa and in yeah. Asia from the communication network perspective. So whether it's fiber, microwave, IoT use cases. And I've seen the technology evolving, you know, from uh, Sonnet to DWDM to the IP to fiber was the holy grail. And then now we move to 5G, which is kind of like wireless fiber. Wireless fiber, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I think uh, there is a lot of potential, you know, to be explored. And uh, the oil and gas industry has been very solid in moving to the latest technology, but mm. not pioneer. Yeah. So, <laughs> as yeah. you know, I mean, you know, they want to see it proved ready, then they will adopt. Yeah. it's. I, I like to joke, you know, if there was a uh, Olympics for oil and gas, everyone wants the silver medal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah, not a lot of enthusiasm to be out there breaking new ground if you don't need to, um, taking risks. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I totally get it. I mean, see- it's a wise technology, it's a wise industry. <laughs> yeah, yep. Well, it's engineering heavy, right? So yeah. the engineers are very cautious by nature, and, and we all want them to be, frankly. Like, there's nothing worse than um, bridges that fall down. Like, you want you want the engineers to do a good job. So it makes complete sense. 100%. Now, when you say you worked in the Gulf, uh, there's lots of different Gulfs out there. You mean Gulf Mexico or the uh, over in the Middle Eastern Gulf? No, Middle East Gulf. So I worked oh, in... Middle East? Yeah, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, Dubai, yeah. and a little bit in Saudi. Ah, uh, yeah. And and your engineering background is in is in elect- electronics or mechanical or civil or uh, electrical engineering was a focus electrical. on telecom. Ah, right. So you did get into this uh, by sticking with the uh, telecoms network for that whole period. Yeah, <laughs> but you know it's changed. We That's were true. engineering or power and uh, resistors and stuff. Yeah. And then we 
move to the now almost it's more IT really than engineering, you know, in, in my career in the telecom. Yeah. But yeah. in the engineering, it's still the same principles apply. And I can relate to engineers in the field, you know, the methodology, how you think about things, adoption, yeah. and, you know, uh, being as risk adverse big time. Yeah. Yeah, that that actually has not changed uh, to any significant degree. Now you mentioned um, 5G. Of course, has been it's the latest in a long series of of telecommunications advancements. What is the big shift here between uh, 4G and 5G? Like, just in a nutshell, if somebody were to ask that question, what, 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 how do you respond to, uh, to, to explain the, the gap? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, 5G is uh, higher bandwidth. So with 4G, you are getting 100 MB. With 5G, you are getting 1 gig and even 20 gig planned for a oh. next year or after. So 20 gig per user device. So that's, you know, bursting <laughs> bandwidth. That's one that thing. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. And the second thing, you know, very important, I think, is the number of devices connected to one radio station. Currently, mm. you have a radio station, you could have like a thousand device connected, and that's fine. I mean, that's enough. But when you think about a refinery or an offshore site, you could have hundreds of thousands of devices, you know, whether yep. it's sensors and stuff. And that's where 5G plays. They can, a radio station, a single radio station can do a, you know, connectivity for over a million connected devices at one radio station. Wow, I had no idea it was that many. That I I uh, I know one oil refinery, Canada's latest oil refinery, had at least twenty five thousand individual sensors installed, um, and it's not a complicated refinery. It's just processing uh, heavy oil from the uh, oil sands, and that does not include people, trucks, equipment, tools, all that. So, exactly. Exactly. wow, a yeah. million devices. So. Yeah. If you were to try and do this, uh, say, because uh, a, a typical application I, I hear engineers trialing at least is they'll they'll attempt a Wi-Fi uh, type service uh, across a big facility. There's no way Wi-Fi can accommodate this kind of volume, can it? No, no. Capacity, uh, it cannot. I mean, the bandwidth, yes, possible, uh, you know. Oh. Uh, with the six uh, Wi-Fi six, you know, it can yep. stream one gig, but uh, the reliability of the Wi-Fi is, uh, you know, is a concern because Wi-Fi it struggles to penetrate metallic structure, you know, especially yep. in the industry uh, yeah. for indoor. And then the other thing, when with Wi-Fi, you know that you are hopping from Wi-Fi access point to another Wi-Fi access point if you have a moving object with. Mm -hmm. the, 5G, I mean, and you have experienced it yourself, if you are on a highway driving 100 miles an hour even, mm. the connectivity stays. And that's very important. The whole thing, indoor, outdoor, acts as one network. Yeah. So it's important for movable objects and to have ubiquitous connectivity that's you know covering the full facilities, indoor and outdoor, with a, mm. no dropping packets at all. So you can trust it for uh, robotics, for uh, autonomous gantry vehicles, uh, for assets moving, you know, that you can, uh, it's not going to drop the packets. And yep. I know the industry does not use, you know, uh, Wi-Fi for this. They use as wires. Exactly, know. yeah. SCADA yeah. systems are all wired devices. They're not, they're not wireless. Exactly. And I, we are with the 5G, we're not planning to replace any wiring. It's just uh, backhauling all this traffic back to the you know, data center ins inside the facilities. Or yeah. as when you want to implement a new use cases like digital twin or uh, asset tracking you know, uh, that are mobile, then you can yeah. use the cellular network for that. I've seen um, videos from oceaneering where they have uh, vessels, drone vessels that are out uh, plying the uh, the oceans, uh, say monitoring subsea infrastructure, pipelines and risers and the like, How, uh, and they're controlled through five or they're they're processing through five G. That's their network uh, connection. How are they doing that when you're out in the open ocean? I Is mean, there 
Yeah, yeah, I love it. I mean, I was there at uh, Stavanger in Norway in their headquarter and yeah. even controlled one of the units. So uh, <laughs> people get confused and I get the question, oh, you know, it's uh, 5G goes under the sea in water. Uh, it's not that way. Uh, really, mm. uh, as we are talking, oil and gas is very cautious industry. So this is all wired. So what you have, you have the landing station. So it goes down into deep sea rather than sending a human being. And mm. it tethered uh, the tool kit that can do um, changing screws, changing yep. uh, equipment, changing things. Yep. It's tethered to that docking station. That docking mm. station has fiber all the way to the buoy. In the buoy, the buoy is big. It's like three by three meters. In the buoy, okay. they put the 5G radio that connects to the nearest uh, vessel. The vessel is sitting on the top, you know, so this is a big ship sitting on the top with the engineers sitting on it and uh -huh. connecting wirelessly to the buoy. And they could be connecting to multiple, you know, uh, stations, you know, so you could have this one um, ship that has a lot of, uh, you know, like four or five, uh, those dived in, uh, machinery and they yep. go down and they are tethered up to one kilometer uh, to the to the toolkit. The toolkit now it's doing you know uh, certain uh, functions like screwing, changing spares, blah blah blah. Yep. But yep. I talked to them. They said we are testing uh, welding. And welding. Welding exactly. And I was like, wow. So there's no need for a diver to go you know, spend, you know, a, a, an hour and go up and then rest, you know, for a week sometimes because, you know, of the course, pressure yeah. on their vessels. They said, no, no, no. Wishineering whole history started that way. They used to send divers and then they decided to move away the divers, the expert divers, and keep them on the ship and do mm. all the things remotely. Mm. It's a bit like how we're we're developing underground mines that have no people underground. It's all done with with drones and robotics, and this is all being done in you know, deep sea, mm. kilometer down, with with uh, robots that are handling the the, the action, uh, with divers probably controlling them from the surface. I'm guessing that's the role of the diver because they know they know how to manipulate uh, um, subsea. Exactly, the divers mm. are sitting up. Uh, in the ship and they're controlling yep. and they're able to do multiple control units because yeah of course yeah, yeah. No. they don't do they need to be on the ship actually because if these networks have this kind of high capacity you you could you could locate them on shore perhaps it, it's mix that's a mix. really good it's mix some of them are really sitting in an operation center in UK yeah. or in Houston and yeah. in Norway, and others are on the ship. So it depends on the tasks, you know, that are required. But it's yeah. a mix of both. Of both, yeah. Tell me about the latency issue here, because I can, I can hear people thinking, well, the reason I like wired is because I don't have any latency. That that signal propagates from the sensor at the at the uh, tool, tool end, and uh, it immediately is on my screen and effectively real time. What, what, what kind of latency do you you end up with in, in this uh, 5G uh, structure? In, in the 5G for such, uh, you know, operation, we are talking about mm. 20 millisecond max. Mm. And we are dropping it to one millisecond in the next version update, which is like in Q1 or Q2 2024. But the requirement from the oceaneering, you know, partner is only 100 milliseconds. Oh, yeah, so they don't require that much, but they said if you can reach to 20 milliseconds and then later to 1 millisecond, we will have a new use cases. As oh, yeah, there'll be a number of use cases. Yeah. Yep, there'll be a number of use cases you can't get to because even 20 milliseconds is too too long. Um, and you can definitely see it in, in healthcare, a different industry. Um, I know that's not our mm -hmm. topic. You know, if you're doing surgery, uh, you, you can't you can't um, you can't tolerate uh, millis multi millisecond delays between the robot doing some sort of surgical procedure and the surgeon operating the tools. That's got to be got to be near effectively real time. And that's a good point, Jeffrey. Um, when we say five G and four G, people think it's five G here 
like a simple product. But 5G, yeah. we have different version. We have the millimeter wave. We have the higher uh, bandwidth, which means, you know, if you put millimeter wave, which is in the range of 5.7 to, you know, 7 uh, gigahertz, then you mm -hmm. are able to do one millisecond now. And later, uh, if you go to a higher uh, frequencies, you can, you know, shorter range, but higher mm -hmm. uh, latency. So mm -hmm. the first question we ask, what are the use cases or application you want to use? Of course, yeah. And then it's a journey. It's like you start today with one thing and then later you move to other applications as needed. Yeah. Uh, I know the industry is also very concerned about uh, its uh, networks uh, uh, being shared with um, outside parties because that opens up the risk of, you know, contention for network uh, access, which is a problem when your assets are all energized. You need that, that low latency, high capacity, wide bandwidth. And, of course, there's the cyber worry that, you you know, some... some uh, um, hacker will break into the network and s start wreaking some havoc. Um, how do how do private networks solve for this? Um, do they do they um, create like standalone network topologies that effectively become your your own private um, service? That is right, and uh, there is a bigger issue with the public network because sometimes they don't cover the remote sites that oil gas <laughs> industry has. Very the, true. Yeah, yeah uh, you know. So that's one thing. The second thing is oil and gas industry is lo really looking to um, to have their own network. So the they want a Wi-Fi or wired that they own. So as a private network, you own the core, you own the radio. So everything stays on premises. Oh. So no data goes outside the facilities. So imagine right. a refinery. All the data stays there. All the data is handled there. And whatever wants who needs to go outside, the IT department decides on what they want to uh, send outside. But uh, So that's on the data. And the security, oh. I mean, every device that we uh, we put on our network has been tested for uh, uh, security attacks cyber security attacks and yeah. for any uh, compatibility with the standards that the industry has you know uh, specified and adopted yeah. Yeah, yeah are the are the uh, transmissions themselves encrypted because with with that much capacity and bandwidth and low latency, uh, you could you could encrypt and then decrypt, or is that really not a network question and more of a topology design? No, it is about uh, network, but it's on your mm -hmm. end if you want to encrypt. Basically, what's happening the encryption and the uh, authentication is happening from the SIM to the core. Mm -hmm. So you have a physical SIM. That's why, in a way, we don't do a SIM. It's a physical SIM. You put it in that router or that cell phone and it is connected right. to the core and everything between is highly encrypted 256 you know uh, uh, encryption so yep. it's highly encrypted but then if you want to do something more you can but i haven't seen anybody doing more than going that. to that trouble yeah no. it's interesting you mentioned eSIM and sim i just upgraded to a new phone this weekend and i was shocked when uh, it said yeah, we're going to do eSIM. And because my, my thought was, I'm going to have to pop the SIM card out of my phone and pop it into the new one. Uh, but uh, but that didn't happen in this instance. So True. for I, consumer, they moved almost especially the iPhone, uh, the app, yeah. they moved to eSIM. And uh, for security, some companies prefer this SIM because yep. you cannot take the SIM and uh, use it somewhere it has to be physically taken and uh, yep. we even for mission critical network we have a technology that the minute you take the sim out it uh, kind of burst you know it's get damaged yep. oh yeah that, okay yeah so, <laughs> it's yep. double security keeps, keeps, yeah keeps the uh, criminals at bay at that stage there's no uh, no fiddling around yep. you can't can't take it and hack into it later on you'll break it yeah. I mean, plus yeah. with the cellular network, you have geofencing. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I don't allow you know anybody to connect outside certain parameters. And I know yep. the user, 
approaching certain areas and I have an alert. So because I know the position by almost 50 centimeters, where the person is. Oh, can you get that precise in terms of location? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Wow. Because the, 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 uh, the potential, say, to put uh, tools, individual expensive tools onto, uh, onto a network, expose them to the network so that you can precisely locate them uh, is a very interesting use case um, to, to apply. It is, it is for uh, mining and mm-hmm. for oil and gas. You know, yeah. for oil and gas, it's more for uh, spare parts where they are and assets, you know, so you can yep. know that uh, they are readily available in uh, whether it's a uh, planned maintenance or unplanned maintenance. Uh, they need you need to know where are your spares and where are your people also. Yeah, there, well, there's, a, there's one use case I know of in, in the um, uh, turnaround world is uh, relates to tool access. Because uh, the turnarounds, tight timelines, a lot of people, a lot of moving parts, and um, the uh, tools become the critical um, critical path item. If you don't have the tool, you can't get the job done. Exactly. And uh, so, locating the tools during a turnaround becomes really critical, uh, so that uh, you know there's no delay in in uh, work service because you haven't got the torque wrench or this particular hoist is missing or you can't find this dolly. You, you've actually got all those tools uh, visible. Yeah. That's exactly the point. Yeah, interesting use case. Yeah. Mm. Now, uh, so I know in your travels, you you, you do get a chance to, um, as you say, you went to spend some time in Norway with um, in the uh, remote operation center there. What are some of the use cases that you're uh, seeing oil and gas companies explore uh, where they're applying, uh, say, private. Um, 5G networks to a unlock opportunity that was otherwise unavailable uh, with uh, with prior topologies. Well, frankly, I see two real use cases, uh, mm. and one of them is empowering the workers. I know we like to call it connected workers, worker safety. Yep. They are very yep. worried about worker safety and worker retention. Uh, and attraction. So there is a lot of knowledge with our workers that are sitting in their mind based on the previous experience, what they have done in these problems. So they want to use those uh, knowledgeable workers to support the new workers that are coming. And when you send a new worker on site, Currently, they're not connected. So they really have the manuals with them and there's no support. Except yeah. possibly the push to talk so they can at least communicate, hey, I'm here, I arrived, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. empowering the worker with a private network, you know, they are connected. They have um, a camera on their mobile, if you want to use their mobile, all connected helmets uh, that mm-hmm. can show the worker, the experienced worker in the remote site that is sitting in the, like, for example, let's use an example, sitting in Houston, supporting somebody anywhere in the world. And that mm. knowledgeable worker can tell the new worker, do this, do that, and look at this manual because they can, since they are connected with their tablets, they can look at the old maintenance records. They can look at the different troubleshooting methodology and mm. they can image, share it, and do that. So that's one aspect to support training and simulation for the workers, you know. The other one is for man down. I mean, if you have a worker with a mobile phone or connected, uh, you know, worker, you will know exactly where they are and you can communicate with them and support them during that uh, session. The third thing I heard from an oil and gas company in Asia, the chief digital officer, his comment was, I want happy workers. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, I just want them to sit and, you know, if there's no emergency, I want them to play on social media, communicate with their families. I don't want them to be isolated as they are now. Yeah. I said, wow, yeah. what about safety, man down, blah, blah, blah. He said, yeah, yeah, they, they come automatically. But what I care about is the happiness and uh, uh, the workers having some leisure time you know, while they are resting. That's a very interesting thought. It's a, and, and it's quite novel. Um, I've never heard that before, but I think that's very valid. A well-run oil company, 
um, uh, if it's if it's in good uh, run good nick and production mode, um, th- the works there's going to be times where workers are you know idle because there isn't exactly. there isn't much to do. Yeah, and so why not equip them with some capabilities so that they're not. Um, and do a video call with their family. Like if you're on an out- offshore platform today, you, there's, you're doing a video call with your family every night. It's not going to happen. No, it's impossible. Yeah, impossible. No, Whereas with this, te- yeah. yeah. Whereas with this this technology, you could actually do that. And and would that make your company more attractive place to work? Arguably, yes. The the second thing I see is uh, uh, to meet the you know regulatory and environmental requirements. And yes. the, most of the oil and gas company has are really committed to do that. Currently, yep. like, uh, and you know, we talked about that, you and I, uh, the way it's monitored now, once every quarter, once every six months, they do yep. a walk manual survey and test, and then they come back and they upload the report. With the yep. cellular technology, with connectivity everywhere, we are able, and we have some partners to put some sensors to monitor mm-hmm. methane and uh, other gases emission, uh, whether mm-hmm. with sensors or cameras. We use a camera as a sensor also, and you can get yep. real-time data and uh, take action accordingly, not wait three months or six months until you take an action. And that's we heard from the expert oil and gas industry that really can help them to reduce their emissions and uh, not even compliant, even improving it beyond uh, the standards that are required on them. Yeah. And I don't think it's just not, it's not limited to emissions. You know, you put these, these uh, center technologies say at a well site and uh, you'd also be able to pick up uh, or at least have the capacity if with the right, right sensors and the network behind it, the capacity to pick up a spill, uh, a sheen on the water where, say, some some uh, petroleum has spilled, um, a, a uh, ability to detect whether or not someone on a site is appropriately attired. Are they, do they have the right personal protection equipment, for instance? Are they smoking? The number of times you see <laughs> photographs of people smoking on a, yeah. on a site is extraordinary. No, definitely. Um, yeah. All of that. I was in a, when I was working in Australia. The uh, uh, one of the problems the Australians had was the international workers who they brought in to do well work uh, were told very carefully: do not throw cigarettes out into the bush in Australia because it's very dry and it'll burn. So the employees said, "Okay, got it." So they threw their cigarette butts into the well oh. where the uh, where because there's no there was no foliage there. <laughs> so, it, but it could explode, but it wouldn't burn at least. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, crazy. Now you mentioned the as we get into sort of single millisecond and below latency, new use cases are going to come into frame. Can you share what some examples of what, like where does this go? Because as if it gets down to that level of latency, um, you know, you're you're. Uh, what what else could we unlock here? I mean, one one thing really, I've seen it uh, tested uh, with our partner, uh, Digital Twin. So oh, yeah. looking at actually the turbine and the flow inside the turbine without touching it, by having you know around like a hundred or 150 sensors, vibration, uh-huh. acoustic, uh, temperature, and others. And all of these uh-huh. sensors are uh, retro, you know, like uh, retrofitting on this turbine, connected wirelessly to a gateway, you know, and then uh, have the dashboard collecting all these data and analyzing the flow inside if there is any abnormal activities and doing changes and seeing the results in real time. Uh, because, in real time. Exactly, because of the low latency. I mean, with they have low, low mm. latency, you are getting it almost real time. And the person is not sitting in front of the machine, as you can see in movies. They are sitting in the network operation center far from the machine. But they are able to see as if they are sitting in front of the machine, every move, every vibration, and the flow. And then ability to so- close a valve, open a valve, all remotely and seeing the impact on this. So first they do it uh, simulation. Then when you want to implement it, as we like to call it dynamic uh, digital twin, it, mm. we believe 
the 5G will be, you know, hugely valuable because you don't want to run all these cables connecting all these sensors uh, to the main uh, data center. You are just wirelessly mm -hmm. spread them and they are connected and sit and analyze and collect all the data and take actions from there. That's the uh, hottest one I've seen. The other one is uh, robotics. So the ability, okay. if there's dangerous fumes, um, you want it autonomous. I mean, especially we, th we see that with the uh, wind turbines. So mm. the wind turbines are virtually autonomous. I mean, we connect them with cellular network. We have several references with the cellular network. Yep. They connect uh, the operator, connect cameras and control um, functionality. And they remotely see what's happening on the outside and inside and uh, adjust accordingly if there's any remote adjustment. And if somebody needs to go physically there, yes, they can dispatch somebody from time to time. But yeah. it's mostly autonomous with the drones because the drone goes there, it's connected over 5G and uh, inside they are seeing everything. Yeah. I mean, those those wind turbines are effectively drones when you start thinking about it. They're just tethered into one spot. True, true, true. That's yeah. way to like to think about them. So if people are thinking, oh, robots are, you know, that's too fictional out there. No, not really. They, these, these devices. And the beautiful thing about a, t a big, big uh, mast of, of a wind turbine uh, is that uh, the, the uh, signal to propagate the, the network uh, is all effectively already in place because you can reach reach all of these different uh, uh, masts, I, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, definitely, because they are like every wind turbine is like a kilometer from each other. And they usually yeah, exactly. configured in a like um, rectangular shape or square shape. Uh -huh. So you put uh -huh. your antenna or our radio and um, it covers the whole area with a two yeah. or three radios maximum. Yeah. Incredibly powerful uh, when you think about it. Let me go back to this digital twin because I think you've touched something here that I hadn't thought about, but it's starting to really kind of sink in. We, we would effectively have a not a digital twin that is running asynchronously with the actual physical process. It's actually running synchronously and identically in real time, which means your operator is interacting or has it interacts with the digital twin. Uh, instead of directly with the equipment. Is that the way to think about that? Exactly. But again, I mean, talking to a lot of oil and gas industries, you know, the major companies, they started their digital twin. And talking to them, they see it as a evolution. You know, it's not like... That's true. Exactly. Yep. Because first thing, you need to connect the assets first and get the data. Yep. So that's, we call it like static digital twin. And then you can use it for simulation. Then you move to the second version, which having like a shadow digital twin, which you have an image of what's happening, but you can monitor. But the truly digital twin is monitor and control, which is, mm -hmm. we started the discussion, this is a, a wise industry. It takes steps, wise steps until they reach their goal. So we see yeah. digital twin adoption by 2025 going until 2027. But it's very powerful and it will uh, empower the workers big times to even no, no need for anybody to go on site. You control it, you yeah. see it, you see the impact and everything. Yeah, it's very powerful. I mean, and, and the industry will value this because we are short of people and we're, we're, uh, if we can achieve this, then um, it allows us to maintain the current infrastructure level at a reduced manning level. And, and no degradation in capability, security, resilience. Um, that's a very powerful uh, formula here. That is the plan. I mean, really, we are trying to empower the workers and empower the industry to meet the, you know, environmental regulation yeah. and uh, extending yep. the life of assets, you know, uh, that yep. if possible. Yeah. yeah. Amra, this has been a very fascinating discussion on the power of 5G networks, and in particular, the, the role of private 5G networks to solve some of oil and gas's more tractable problems. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. No, my pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, good luck to everybody who started. We are excited to uh, start the journey with you. 
That was Amar Sabah, the Vice President for Industry and Partnership for Private Networks in the Oil and Gas Industry Vertical with Ericsson. I was really struck by his description of digital twin technology. The first, the static digital twin, simply means connecting sensors up to our infrastructure so as we can collect real-time data. But the end game is the dynamic digital twin, where the digital twin is actually connected in real time with our, our physical process, and we are able to interact with the digital twin and the physical process at the same time. Thanks for listening to the Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. This podcast can be found everywhere podcasts are available, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find all the resources and links mentioned in the episode in the show notes, and you can listen to the previous episodes at jeffreycan.com. If you have a moment, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes as it helps others find the show along with other great content. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Digital Innovations in Oil and Gas. The podcast returns in a week with another episode, so stay tuned.